Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Lineup with Dave Prodan. I'm Dave Prodan, and this is episode 22. A quick thank you to everyone who reached out in regards to our break last week so I could take some time off for my dad's passing. It means a lot, so genuinely, thank you very much. We're still navigating the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're still starting every show with the following notes. The CDC's identified symptoms for COVID-19 include runny nose, sore throat, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If you're not feeling well, call your doctor. The World Health Organization's behavioral recommendations that everyone should follow. Wash your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you have to cough or sneeze, do so into your elbow. Social distancing. Avoid groups of 10 or more people and stay away from everyone as much as you can. If you're not feeling well, get checked out as soon as possible. And if you can work from home, do it. And a massive thank you to the essential workers out there from hospital staff to grocery workers, delivery drivers, firemen, and everyone out there working through the pandemic to keep everyone safe. Now, a few housekeeping notes before we get into today's conversation. The Lineup Podcast has an Instagram now. It's at the Lineup Pod, one word, and you can follow us for updates, teasers, behind the scenes notes, or just contact us if you like. So check that out. Two weeks ago, the WSL, in partnership with the world's best surfers, launched its hashtag stay local campaign on social media. This is a campaign that I had the privilege of co-developing with our team at the WSL, and it essentially encourages any of us, if we're able, to support local communities as much as we can right now. Board builders, surf shops, coffee shops, anyone who is integral to our respective local communities that may benefit from our concentrated help right now. If you can help, get involved and send the WSL your stories. Monday's The Vault released the highlight show from the 2012 Billabong Rio Pro, where Joel Parkinson and his timeless brand of power surfing and tube sense vaulted him into the final, where he fell short, but it ultimately serviced his long overdue title clinching later that season at Pipeline. And Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday's Rewind will feature the 2017 drug aware Margaret River Pro at Main Break, where it was pumping and the world's best surfers shifted the performance boundaries of what is possible at the Chunky Reef Break out west. Both shows are playing on worldsurfleague.com. Do not miss them. And, as you may have guessed, both shows showcase the talents of today's guest for the lineup at low tide. As we've done the past couple weeks, today's episode includes a rewatch and a breakdown of one of his heats for our rearview segment. If you'd like to watch along with us, you can head over to the WSL YouTube channel and find the video in the lineup playlist. All right, our guest today is someone who, perhaps more so than any other surfer in history, grew up in the brightest of surfing spotlights and has had to navigate the world of expectations in a way that no one else ever has. Seven elite championship tour victories, in Jersey and out of Jersey barrier breaking performances, and two world titles later, he's still arguably approaching the prime of his career. Please enjoy the lineup's low tide conversation with the North Shores, John John Florence. The good old clap, take one. That's right. <laughs> How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did, I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once, let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. All right. So two-time world champion John Florence joining us for the, another edition of The Lineup at Low Tide. That's what we're calling this podcast during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it also gives us permission to bring you back for a full lineup in the future if we don't scare you off. But um, it's surreal times. How are you doing today? Um, I'm doing pretty good considering I think, uh, the North shore is kind of like a little bubble in a way out here, you know, it's a small community. So I think it's being, that's good for us, but it's a crazy time in the world. Yeah. Did you, did you surf today? Are you going to surf today? Um, there's actually a really nice swell picking up right now. The buoys are a pretty good size. So I think we're just kind of waiting around. <laughs> okay. Um, any tips that you found for everyone else on kind of getting through quarantine that you've discovered over the last six weeks? Um, I think it's hard. It's really hard to give tips because 
uh, right now here in Hawaii, we're still able to surf and yeah. we're able to exercise and do all these things. And so like my daily routine hasn't changed too much because I do a lot of it just by myself or with my brother. Um, so I go surfing, ride my bike. Um, yeah. And so like, I don't know. I think when you're stuck inside, just, it's a good time to kind of take a step back from everything and you can have a look at your life, I guess, and just see where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> for, for better or worse, I think for a lot yeah. of us. <laughs> well, cool. Well, we'll get into the the meat of today's conversation, which is around navigating expectations, the uh, the concept of celebrity and and performance shifting. But but first, um, if you had to describe your reaction to Game of Thrones season eight in one <laughs> word, what would that word be? One word. Uh, I wasn't that. Well, I I don't have a word, but it's just I wasn't that stoked with it. <laughs> I think that works. <laughs> I was a right, little bummed. We'll, we'll create a a special bonus rushed. podcast. It rushed. felt rushed. That's felt. That's fair. We'll create a special bonus podcast. It'll just be you and I, and we'll break down Game <laughs> of Thrones for everybody else. Okay. Okay, so so as I said, today we're going to try to navigate this conversation around the singular topic of navigating expectations, whether they're the ones that you set for yourself or they're put upon by family and friends or sponsors or the media or the collective surfing community. So maybe if you could help us kind of start at the beginning with you, do you remember the first time you felt like there were external expectations on your surfing? Was it like your first sponsor or a magazine photo or anything like that? Um, I don't think, I don't really remember a particular time, but <laughs> I feel like there's I've felt expectations ever since I was a little kid, just growing up in a competition kind of atmosphere. There's always some sort of expectation it feels like around you, um, whether you feel like it's from yourself and wanting to win or it's from the people around you just wanting good things to happen, you know? And so, mm. um, yeah, I just feel like it's kind of been around my whole life. <laughs> yeah. I guess that makes a lot of sense. You know, having spent time on the North shore, it is a, it's a, naturally kind of competitive environment so you're either probably putting expectations on yourself to perform better or you're kind of feeling it from the community in a lot of ways yeah i think i think a lot of it comes from um myself um i think you know when you, when you're growing up here on the north shore it's everyone every competitive surfer in the world comes here for three months of the year and yeah. it's when we have our best waves and so every time you go surfing you're automatically like jumping into this like really like tense competitive atmosphere, even though it may not be an event, maybe right before the pipe masters or before the triple crown starts, you have all these people here practicing, trying to get their waves, trying to get their photos, trying to get their clips. And so there's everyone's competing on so many different levels and yeah, <laughs> it's intense. Would you say you're a total product of that environment? Like if you'd grown up in, I don't know, like Southern California or Central America that you might not be as aggressive or competitive, not aggressive is not the right word, but more just driven to perform. Definitely. I think I'm a product of the environment. I think that's where I get a lot of com my competitive drive is from that and growing up with two brothers also gives mm -hmm. you a lot of drive and wanting to do things better and better. Um, and yeah, I think just being here, you know, if I would have grown up somewhere in uh, Central America away from that whole big scene or somewhere far off this kind of scene, then I think my life might be very different because I have a whole other side of me that's not, that I like to kind of take a step back and uh, learn things more at a slower pace, like with, you know, like sailing and all these other things that I like to do. I like to just get into that, but then that competitive drive always comes into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense. I mean, I guess it, everyone kind of has to balance and calibrate like at some point. So if you have surfing over here and, and it's very fast for you and, and, and competitive, then it makes sense that you would pursue a different kind of part of your life that, that is more relaxed. Yeah, for sure. And I think pursuing these other things just allows me to learn. I don't know. It's really fun having that beginner's mindset and being in that kind of beginner's attitude and like, okay, like what, what can I, like this, is, it just makes things so exciting, you know? And then you can almost bring it back into surfing in a way with that mindset. So I don't know. It's really cool. And keeps things fresh. 
Yeah. Now, in my experiences with you, you're a generally a pretty cruisy, calm, collected individual. And I think that that's probably what most people that don't know you would probably think too. And whether that's true or not, and we can discuss it if you'd like, but were there points when you were younger in your young life being in the surfing spotlight that were hard for you? Like, were there situations that didn't work out? And then looking back, you thought, well, that was maybe like a growth opportunity. Um, yeah, definitely. I think through competition through my life has, has had so many ups and downs in my surfing career, like whether it's been injuries or a string of losses in events. And I remember when I first started doing the QS, um, I didn't do very good on the QS for a long time. I would like make one heat and then lose and then maybe two heats and then lose. And, um, at one point I was just like, so frustrated that, um, I even was like, ah, oh, is this what I'm going to do? You know, am I going to, am I going to continue trying to chase after this QS dream of making the tour eventually? Um, and then, but it's interesting in life how different things can kind of like snap your, the, your like path. And all of a sudden you're going one, one other, a different direction. You know, like I remember I was in that mindset. I was like, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I ended up, I broke my back. And so I was like out of the water for a while. And, and then when I came back from that, I was just so excited to go surfing again. And I kind of got invited on a couple movie trips and it just made my excitement even more like getting to go surf with Chippa Wilson and all these guys with Kai Neville and doing, trying to do big airs. And I don't know, I got a lot of excitement out of that. And then that kind of flowed like into my competition surfing and um, yeah, one thing led to another and it's qualified. <laughs> It, and it's like, it's a pretty, it's a pretty serious thing when you're a young guy or like young woman, like being kind of thrust onto the international stage and going to these exotic places and, and having the freedom to kind of do whatever you want. And, you know, I always think of it too, like I, I, I turned 37 today and, um, I still don't have my shit together, you know? Like, so I think of like poor, like 16 and 17 year olds that have to kind of go out in the spotlight, whether it's social media spotlight or just kind of in the surf media spotlight um, they kind of almost don't, it doesn't feel like they necessarily get to make mistakes without kind of getting rousted really badly, you know? And, and I don't know, I, I, I kind of want to hear if, if that was ever your experience having been in the spotlight, as you said, since you were just a little kid. Well, it's hard though. It's hard. Cause I feel like when I was a kid, when I was little, you know, th or there wasn't Instagram and there wasn't this huge social media boom quite yet. There's, Facebook and stuff like that, but it wasn't mm. what it is today. You know, I think what it is today is a whole different animal. And, uh, what you're saying of being like, you do one thing wrong or different and it's up on a million different sites and it's all over the internet or whatever it is, you know, it's, it's really hard to wrap your mind around that. And I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that today. But when I was young, I didn't really ever feel that too much because I don't think it was such a, had such a big place in the world yet. Yeah. And you brought up um, going on films with guys like Chippa and stuff. And, and this feels like it's a topic that gets debated a lot. But surfing, as you know, doesn't just happen in competition. And the surfing world has had an at times tense relationship with the sport of surfing versus the lifestyle of surfing and competitive surfing versus free surfing. Was there ever a point in your career where you thought, you know what, I'd, I'd rather just stay home and surf pipe more and do free surf trips and get paid that way. And, and I'm going to do that instead of competition <laughs> all the time. I think about that every <laughs> <Even now>. year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's definitely a different side of surfing, but the one thing that you don't get at it, like free surfing is such an amazing thing. You know, you really can be yourself and surf the way you want to surf. Whereas when you're competing, it's really easy to fall into, uh, what other people are thinking the whole time. And so you, you're kind of being formed by the media or formed. It's, it's easy to fall into that kind of track, you know, whereas right. when you're free surfing, you're just kind of going and pumping down the line and doing the biggest air you can. You can try a hundred of them. If you don't land them, they're like, okay, I'll try again tomorrow. And I'll come out with an edit whenever I have a good edit. There's no, there's not these like timelines and deadlines. And so, mm. but then again, that's what I love about competing is it's this amazing platform to really kind of test yourself and make this incredible challenge, um, for the mental side of things. And in the last few years, 
that's what I've been finding. I really love is like finding these little tweaks and the mental side of things um, to be able to go out there in a heat when it's, when you only have 30 minutes and you know, there's a ton of pressure of a world title or a, an event win or whatever it is and be able to perform the way you want to perform. I think that's one of the biggest challenges ever is to be able to surf the way you want to surf with tons of people watching with a time limit, being judged by other people, all these different things. And so that's, an, for me, that's the, that's the thing I love about competing. And that's what keeps me coming back is that challenge itself. You know, I think that's something that <clears throat> in my experience, it's only like a recent phenomenon that the Delta between how you want to surf and how you're able to surf in that 30 minute competitive window is closed. And I'm not just talking about you specifically, but kind of the, all the CT men and women combined, because, you know, I think back I'm 15 years at the company now, like even 10 years ago, you would watch guys surf or girls surf in free surfs versus how they competed, even with all that pressure on the line. And it was, it, there's still a big gap, you know, between what they mm -hmm. were able to do and what they were doing to, to get through the heat or to get to win the contest. And now it feels like guys like you and Gabrielle and Italo are, are kind of surfing at the cutting edge, you know, Carissa and Tyler and Steph are surfing at the cutting edge of what you're able to in the live arena a lot of times, which is really like quite different for, compared to what it was a while ago. Like, uh, it being like competition surfing's right up there with free surfing, <laughs> right? I, I mean, that, that's, that's my opinion in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that there's, there's the freedom element to it, but I just feel like, you know, you're actually seeing a lot of surfers push themselves past what they, they were comfortable doing in free surfs in heats because there's more on the line and, and the conditions it. around it, um, they feel sharper because of it. For sure. I think, um, there's something special about competition and, in in that way, you know, in the sense of like this year when I was doing the, did the pipe event, I was like only five months out of my knee surgery. And, um, you know, I was surfing in front of my house right before the event and I was so nervous and I was just like, okay, I just kept trying like the different movements that I was going to have to get in out there. And then so nervous every session. But then when I got into that heat and I like went through my routine and like snapped into that competitive mindset, everything goes out the window and you're just like, boom. Okay. Like you're not thinking about anything else, but performing your best. And so that to me was like a really clear moment of like, Whoa, it's pretty cool. when you snap into that moment of what, what you can, what you can accomplish. For sure. Now um, you talked about when you broke your back, but I wanted to bring that up too, because when you qualified, it was, it was oddly enough, kind of under the radar because you had broken your back. I think it was a pipe. Then you went on a little bit of a rampage and, and qualified at kind of that weird mid-year rotation point in 2011. My qualification is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something we've been talking about quite a lot recently because you can kind of contrast that to one of your contemporaries in Kolohe who qualified at the start of 2012. And Nike at the time was like pumping out these edits that were essentially anointing him as a title contender before he'd even put a jersey on at Snapper. And just like contrasting your experience with his experience, it felt like Kaloe had an immediate public expectation to perform. And even though he had a pretty respectable rookie season, he you know he made the quarterfinals in France, it seemed like the surfing world was pretty harsh on him because he wasn't winning CT events like out the gate and contending for a world title. What do you what are your thoughts on kind of those different experiences? Um, yeah, well, like you said, my experience definitely felt like under the radar. It was, not, it was the one year they did the half year mark. I think me, Gabe and Maggie qualified on that half year mark. And the only reason I qualified was because, uh, I was on a trip with Yaden Nickel, who was qualifying and he broke his leg. I think it was super badly on the trip we were on. And so he was out and I was the next person in. It's just this like crazy chain of events. And then, yeah, and I was in and it kind of just happened, you know, like it didn't really seem like a huge deal halfway through the year. First event is at lowers, just, the tour is just going on. And then Kolohe, meanwhile, it was, I think he won the QS season that year by kind of a good lead. I'm pretty sure. Right. I think Am so. I right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then growing up, like Kolohe was, uh, the American, like, you know, I grew up against Kolohe, surfing against Kolohe since I was young and he won so many national titles and he was like this, like, he's, I mean, still, is, he's like this golden American boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
he surfed so well. Like he was like in the QS and the national things. And so I can see that being a hard thing to come into the CT and having all that pressure of like, like you said, Nike putting out these edits and everyone being like, okay, he's going to blow up. And then it's hard. It's so hard to compete when you get on tour. I don't know. At least, at least for me, like I, I luckily enough had it where I didn't have so much spotlight like he did. Mm. And but I got on tour and I was like, whoa, wait, I have to serve against Kelly. Like I've been looking up to him since I was like a little kid. <laughs> like, I can't win these events. Like it's so hard to believe in yourself to win these events as soon as you qualify. Um, and so luckily enough, I had it without all that expectation and he had it with mountains of expectation. Well, and funny enough and kind of related, like part of that under the radar approach, whether it was by design or just kind of incidental that you had towards qualifying played into this general sense around the tour that a lot of people didn't really realize or appreciate how well-rounded you actually were. Like I, I distinctly remember a lot of conversations with the punditry where they were along the lines of like, well, geez, I really like John. I hope he gets a lot of conditions with barrels in these events so he can requalify, which in hindsight is like super ridiculous. Um, and you know it's an igno- it's an ignorance that that you kind of likely shattered when you won the Billabong Rio Pro in 2012, largely on the strength of turns and kind of backhand rotations. Um, do you think that the surfing world pigeonholing you as just a barrel guy in 2011 was unfair, or do you think that you actually made significant strides in your own performance in that time, or or maybe a bit of both? Um, I think I learned a ton as soon as I got onto the tour. Um just trying to surf my best trying to keep up with gabriel he was winning he won like three events on that half year mark which was crazy like um we got off we got off the qs and onto the tour and then he won there was only five events left and he won three of them so i was just trying I to think, i think you won two but yeah no you, i think you won, two, you won whatever Fra- yeah. france and two. san fran but same thing it's like he wasn't same even thing. a full-fledged like, rookie was, and came in and beat people yeah yeah it's crazy two events in a year period you're like in a world title race you know and so I was just trying to keep up with him and trying to learn and um, from everyone else on tour. And I think, yeah, when the when the Rio comp happened, that was like a huge stepping stone for me and in, in the belief in myself, of like, oh whoa, like I just won a CT event, like I can win these events. That's crazy. <laughs> now, when you say that you were trying to keep up with Gabriel, do you mean like competitive wise or psychologically or just were, were there things that he was doing in his surfing that you feel like you weren't doing in yours at that time? Um, I think competitive wise, like he's just a machine of a competitor, you know? And I think even when we first through the QS and then first getting on the tour, it was just like, you could see it right away. He's so consistent. And um, so I kind of naturally wanted to be doing that also. <laughs> yeah. And so I tried my best and yeah. That's what it's worked out. Okay. Yeah. It's worked out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we, when we were talking to Mick a few weeks ago, he brought up this insight that I thought was interesting because he's was arguably like the most hype surfer in history, given when he qualified and the sort of the ravenous Australian market. And he told me, he goes, I didn't think I could win for years until after I qualified. Um, which I thought was interesting, you know, and, and was there a point in your own development where you realized I have all the tools here. There's no reason why I can't win a world title. Um, do you, do you kind of remember that moment? Definitely. I think like it was like, um, 2015, I was probably, I think I was like just starting to wrap my head around like, okay, like, you know, family and friends and people are, helping that too and going you could you can do it you know you can do it and i'm like okay like maybe i can and then like 2006 the end of 2015 i was just like all right i had done this big movie project and i was just like i'm gonna put my focus into competing i don't know what's gonna happen but i'm just gonna focus on doing my best in competing and then 2016 i i won and so it was just this like, and when I won, it was, again, it was that stepping sort of like, oh, wow, like I did this. Like, I can't believe I did this. I can do this, that belief. And so it was like going from not believing to focusing in the process to being able to do it and then having the belief that I can do it. 
think growing up where you grew up and, and at the time you grew up and obviously digesting all the surf videos and watching all the contests. And as you said, when you came on tour, it's like, holy crap, I got Kelly Slater in my heat. Like, you know, we really kind of deify like a lot of these surfers that, that win events and win world titles and stuff like that. So I'd imagine like it's a big hurdle to get through that, just drawing like a Mick Fanning or a Joel Parkinson or a Taj Burrow and being like, okay, I'm not only can I hang with this person, I can beat them in a lot of ways. For sure. It's, it's so hard. And it took me a few years to get through that, you know, like I won the Rio event and I was like, oh, okay, I can win these events. That's crazy. And then, um, I don't think, I think 2015, I won France, maybe. I don't know what year that was. 2014. But it took me a little while of, of like those, like, of winning the events and just being like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> but All it right, definitely well, took the focus though, too, of like focusing into the process of it. Right. Because you said you had other projects you were working on. So you actually like intentionally made that decision where you're like, okay, I'm going to focus all my energy on doing this now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, related to the topic of having all the weapons, both physically and mentally to win world titles, we're going to dive into one of your most impressive performances in recent years for this week's segment of the rear view, which is your semifinal bout against Jack Freestone at the 2017 drug aware Margaret river pro. Awesome. All right. So bit of a scene set here. You're the reigning world champ. You've just finished a respectable third at the opening event of the season on the gold coast, which Owen won. Um, and you've been rampaging through the drug aware Margaret river pro. Uh, 1927 over Jacob Wilcox in round three, 1916 over Michelle and Connor in round four, 1804 over Michelle in the quarterfinals. And now we're here. So you're having a really good event at this point. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're number 12. Why are you number 12 in terms of jerseys? Just one more than Kelly? Uh, no, when the whole jersey number thing came out, um, I just, I feel like, I think I like looked up sports jerseys numbers and just picked one. <laughs> 12 is a good number. Tom Brady, Tom Brady had 12. Oh, there's brother in the white jersey. There That's he is. Good. I don't, I don't think anyone else has ever rocked an all white jersey except for Kelly in France in 2005 when he was the white knight to Andy's black knight. Yeah. Who, who aside from a brother on tour is going to run the next white jersey or white, white wetsuit? Uh, I don't know, brother. I think brother. I think brother's gonna run it through, <laughs> through his career. It's gonna be. It's not gonna be Kelly's anymore. It's me, brother's thing. I like it. So you don't have inside position here with Jack at the start of the heat. Is that something that's important to you, or what was going on? Um. Yeah, I like to just get the heat started. Right. Kind of. I I don't like to um. Uh, I don't know. It depends. Every heat changes a little bit, you know, it depends on the waves, the conditions and where you're at. But for the most part, days like this, the waves are pumping. There's a lot of waves coming through. So better off just getting the heat started and getting things rolling. Cause then you jump into that priority and uh, yeah, feels like you're bound to get on a good wave. Yeah. And Jack, Jack, it seems like he was always a better surfer than his ranking reflected. I think he's a little bit more consistent now, but you know, a two-time world junior champion. He's he's got a lot of weapons. What what are your thoughts on on freestone? Jack is an amazing surfer, and he's a really good free surfer too. Like he can do pretty much everything anyone else can. Huge airs. He rips small waves, and um, he has some. He's had some really good heats too, where he's been ripping. And so it's just it's really hard to tie it all together. Like I said, it takes a. I feel like it takes a couple of years to find your rhythm on the tour and find like kind of your process of the way you want to go about it. And you guys both ride for Pizel surfboards now. Do you like having guys like Jack and high profile surfers on the team or do you worry that his boards are getting a little more attention? Uh, no, I think it's super cool actually because it's always nice to have other good input like that. And um, I think I was injured last year and then one of the boards I ended up riding last year, the Shadow, I think Jack had been riding it a bunch and said he really liked it. And then surprise mm -hmm. made me one and I came out of it. And so it's really nice to have that, you know, so like I, I'm injured and Jack's surfing and then he finds a really good board he likes and he can kind of play with it. You like guys that. get to feed off each other pretty well. Yeah. 
And here's that, here's that, this must have been the 2016 final between you and him. As you said, he's had some pretty good heats. He, he had a good run at this event. Yes, this event, um, yeah, it was a hard, it was a really hard event to surf because the waves were <laughs> chunky. It was closing yeah. out. And I was pretty nervous going into it because, like that right there, Jack's really good at airs. Um, and that's pretty much what it was made for. If, you, if you're going to do airs, you're probably going to win the heat. So it was nerve wracking going into it against him. Hmm. And your first four wins on tour were actually all in beach breaks. You had the, the two wins in Rio, 2012, 2016, and then Hossiger in 2014. Oh, Astro Deck, core score. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Panish as well. So, th- so you were, you were really quite good in beach breaks. I mean, early on that, that looked like it was a more comfortable space for you. Yeah. And I think, um, being comfortable in beach breaks just comes from growing up here in Hawaii. I feel like a lot of the waves are kind of have that beach break feel to them mm. where it's kind of peaking. It's unpredictable. It's you're going left, you're going right. Even pipe has that, you know, it's, it's, it has that feel a lot of the time too, or it's a like kind of a beach break on reef. Mm. Um, and so just growing up here with that power and learning where to get out and how to get out quicker and what waves look good, I guess it's, um, yeah, I think it just comes with growing up here. Yeah. So we're at the 27 and a half minute mark, no waves ridden. Um, you know, how do you kind of identify which waves you want on a morning like this out at main break? Well, I think you're pretty much just looking for those really nice open face rights. Um, so there's the occasional left sometimes but where we're sitting at this point when it's this big, you're kind of outside where the good lefts are. It feels like the good mm. lefts are the ones that kind of run underneath it. And so you're just waiting for those sets that are coming in that have that nice kind of bend on the wall where you can kind of just open up some turns. And, um, I think my first day I got a little barrel and it was, and I was, I was really starting to get that way because Jack didn't even really look at it. Um, I got a barrel and then did a couple of turns and got like a seven. Um, so you can kind of sneak these like mid-sized ones that are so good out there. You take off and all of a sudden you have this canvas in front of you and you're just like, you get like, so you get so excited. You're like, Oh, what am I going to do here? <laughs> You guys are actually kind of, you sitting over on the left. So, so when you're getting rights there, you're not actually even sitting at the peak apex. You're you're kind of backdooring that first section from the side of the left, right? Yeah. We might be sitting a little deeper here though, because the priority hasn't been set yet. And Mm. so, um, just making sure I don't maybe give him the best position to get a really good way. It's a really good (laughs) way to come in. Uh, So you, like I said, you definitely have to play it to the conditions. I can see this is like this one was like a little bit of a deeper one and had that little bit of a barrel and it worked out for me. And I know you said you like to get started early on. Like, do you do you care if you get the very first wave or are you just looking for a wave early in the heat to get going? It's like I said, depends on the conditions, you know, like um, and where you're at. Um, but for me. I like getting the heat started for sure, but I also sometimes like last year I had a couple really good heats where I didn't get the first wave and I, you know, the other guy took the inside, got the first wave and I kind of just set out the back. Like at Bells, I did that a lot just because there were so many waves coming through. I was like, okay, he can have it and I'll just wait until a big open face right comes and just try to do my thing, surf the best I can. Mm. And you've spent, you spent a lot of time in WA over the course of your career, whether it's filming for movies and it seems like you and your family like to, to be out there quite a lot. Um, you know, what do you like about it in, in West Oz? West Oz is an amazing place. I don't know. It's one of my favorite places on the tour. It's, it really has that feel of Hawaii to me, like tons and tons of waves, lots of power. Um, it's, it's cool because the predominant wind blows into the right, Mm. which in Hawaii it's, the complete opposite it blows into the lefts, and so having it blow into the rights like that is just so exciting for me because we never get that at home and i'm just like oh my gosh you can do the biggest airs <laughs> when the wind's blowing to the rights like that um so i always get really excited about that and i can ride the boards that i ride here at home all the time which i love. right now you have to actually punch through the end of this barrel here is that easier than it looks because it looks, <laughs> looks kind of hard um I think that one wasn't too bad of one. Sometimes you can see it when you're in the barrel and you kind of start riding up higher and higher and higher. And then you kind of like get on that back foot and set 
kind of brace for impact of okay. the lip and then it kind of like it kind of shoots you out um that one looked a, kind of a little bit frothy and open though it didn't look so much sometimes it's just a complete like lip that hits you this podcast isn't actually for other people this is just like a personal tutorial for me getting better so that's why <laughs> it's just it's just a clever ruse perfect do you ever think about sharks out there um definitely I mean, I feel like that's all people talk about when you're there. So it's hard <laughs> not feel to like think it about it. <laughs> it's really hard not to think about. Uh, yeah, so definitely think about the sharks. But when it's blue and sunny like this, you're not thinking about it at all. Mm, fair. I think the, actually, I think the next heat, Felipe was in the next, Felipe and Kolohe were in the next heat, I think. And they got called out of the water because a few sharks came through the lineup or mm. like a big salmon pile came through. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to think about when it's bl- sunny blue and offshore no oh, here goes jack now, nice what size train. board like were you writing yeah uh i was writing a six two okay which may have been a little smaller oh, than wow, some of the wow. guys boards holy crap <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, a little smaller than some of the other guys' boards. Um, right. But And I think that just comes from, this hurts Ooh. so bad right oh. here. I hit the rock Ooh. so hard. I yeah. thought I broke my arm. Yeah, what happened here? <laughs> so that first turn felt so good. It's it, And that's like my favorite feeling is like when you're going into a turn like that and you're just being pressed against your board and everything's really holding in. Hmm. And then I was all excited after I got that last turn in. And then when I came out the last turn and looked up, I like saw the rock draining out and I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, Oh no, I had like two thoughts. One was to like, try to like kind of like jump up onto it or just jump in front of it. And, uh, so I jumped in front of it and just went like elbow first, just boom. <sighs> and I remember just being underwater being like, Oh my God, I just broke my arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't and was, you look like you're in a bit of pain at the moment yeah it was so sore it was like one of those ones where it's just such a deep pain like all the way up your arm oh perry hatchet perry hatchet's on the ski what's he saying yeah you're fine no nah, it's all right <laughs> 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 it was a pretty deep little cut on there i think i had to get a few stitches after this heat right Oh, Perry was, um, he was the head judge on tour when I started. He's a, he, he, would, I think him just saying you're fine is probably no the most accurate thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember that I was going back out of here and I was just like, oh, it hurts so bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> Now, now on that first turn, it, it did look like what you were saying before. You actually kind of came from the left side of the peak and, and banked around the apex. So here it is again, I guess. And it, you actually got the timing looked really well for that section, you know, where, where yeah. maybe Jack so wasn't was, in the right spot. That was one of those midsize ones. And you're getting in kind of from a little bit deeper on it. And um, you're just getting so much speed because you're coming from around at bottom turning and coming right up into that pocket of it where there's like the most power in the wave. And when it's really smooth like that, you can just kind of oh, yeah. lay into it and push as hard as you want. So this was the uh, six two ghost model from Paisel. Six two ghost, yeah. Had they had he even released that model yet, or was this kind of a prototype at this point? I think he was just starting to release it. Um, yeah, this is the first event that I really rode it in, and mm. I was like, "Whoa, this board's pretty good." <laughs> it's, it's a good, good outing for the board. Yeah. I had ridden it in Hawaii, the like the end of the winter here in Hawaii a bit, and read it. I thought it was a barrel board at first, because of its shape. And Paisel kind of explained it to me like that. But then it just had it was so loose yeah. that I just started uh, doing more and more turns and surfing it a lot more. Airs, yeah. turns, everything. It felt really good on it. Well, it's um, it's worthy of the seventeen replays we're getting here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my god dude yeah. <laughs> it's just not a good place to fall no it hurts <laughs> so you're probably bleeding at this point are you thinking about sharks now or no uh i think jack said something <laughs> about <laughs> sharks started paddling like, away from you or something. Like showing him it and i was like oh 
is it bad? And he's like, oh, it looks pretty deep. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, I was bleeding. And then there were sharks in the water for the next heat. <laughs> there you go. You brought him in. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you did get it. I think that that came in at a 937. Jeez. Yeah. And then I think at this point, I was pretty fired up. Um, And so the adrenaline was building back up and the pain was still there, kind of going away. And I was just like, okay, I'm just going to wait and try to get one more clean wave. Um, Yeah. But I mean, at this point, I was feeling pretty good. Jack only had a four and had a nine or seven. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good question too, because it's the semis. Um, you know, you're bleeding from your elbow. You've comboed Jack. You've got one excellent, really excellent score and one really good score, and Jack doesn't have anything. Did it ever cross your mind to be like, look, you know, I'm I'm going to go in and just see how it goes, or 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 no? No, it didn't. No, that didn't cross my mind at all because I, I was able to move my arm. I was able to paddle, and I was like mm. pushing up my board and stuff, and. So I was like, oh, it still works. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> still functions. Strider, hardest working man in surfing. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever talk to him out in the water when you have heats with him? Um, yeah, some, or not, I don't really, or Strider? Yeah, Strider. <laughs> I don't really talk to him, but he's always fired up on a room. He's, <laughs> he's, like, he's talking to no! you. <laughs> yeah, he's, all, he's fired up and you're like, yeah, that was sick. <laughs> <laughs> What about with Jack? Do you ever talk to like Jack or other competitors much or you just kind of keep to yourself? Uh, I think it depends on the heat, the circumstance, mm. the waves, the competitor. Some competitors are... Um, Jack and I, I think, talk uh, sometimes when we have heats. We definitely talked in this heat. I was asking about my cut. <laughs> uh, and then, but sometimes you get in a heat and it's just like a big heat or the waves are grinding and you're just trying to focus as much as you can. Right. We were, um, we were talking to Tanner a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about a heat with Kelly and you know, the infamous, like, do you talk to Kelly? Do you let Kelly talk to you? And he's like, no, he's like, I try not to. And he goes, I tried to break away, like, and run all the way to middles to paddle out. And I avoided him, but then, you know, he ended up like running all the way up to me and like this army of fans was coming behind him. And it was worse than if he just talked to me. <laughs> That's funny. How big a board do you think Jack's on there? It looks a little bit bigger than you six two because he's a pretty big guy too. Yeah, Jack's tall. Uh, hard to say six four maybe. Mm. Um, yeah, which would which would have been a good size board for for out there that day. I think a lot of guys would have been riding from six threes, six fours. Right. And how many boards would you bring to like an event like this, like to pick from like five, 12, 20? We usually travel with 14 boards. Mm. So like two, we have these board bags that hold seven boards each. Yep. And so we travel with two of those. Um, and it's, it's hard cause like Margaret's can be pretty small and it can be really big. Mm. So you're kind of traveling with a pretty wide range of a quiver. And then you're also traveling with boards that you're like, all right, I'm only going to free surf on these boards because, you know, like when you have a board, a really good board, like the board I had in this event, I'm only riding in the heats. So I'm not riding in any of the free surfs or anything like that. Right. And and do you ever bring like a board that you would never even consider riding in competition, like a little fish or a quad or anything that's not, not the same um, thing that you'd be training off of? Sometimes I, or a lot of the time I don't normally because we just have so many boards already. Yeah. And if I'm surfing, I'm usually trying to kind of either try, uh, I'll bring a smaller epoxy board because it feels like something we're always trying to work on to get better. Right. But yeah. that still has that competition kind of like intent towards it. You're going surfing and you're like, okay, this board feels pretty good with these fins. Like, and it's fun. They're fun to ride, but that's yeah. probably like and for the most part. That seems pretty consistent between a lot of the guys up at the top. Like they just go, look, I like riding those boards, but like, I just need to stay as sharp as I can on my, my go-to equipment or, or whatever is close. And we got Ross sure. on camera now. Um, yep. he's your coach. He, he looks a little coach. concerned. What do you, what do you think he's saying? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think he is, he is pretty fired up this event. I think he was stoked. <laughs> 
when and why did you start working with Ross as your coach? Um, so that was kind of in that two, the end of 2015 year. I was sort of like, okay, I'm going to start taking this seriously. And then um, I actually started working with Bead first. And that was like the first time I've worked with like a coach person like that. Um, and Bead helped me a ton. Mm. I worked with him for the first three, three events, I think. Um, and just Snapper and all those waves. And then in Fiji also. And then that kind of like changed my mind. Like, okay, like I want to get someone, you know, Ross popped into my mind because he lives in Hawaii, right down the road. I've grown up with him. He's got such a good mind about competitive surfing and um, technique and stuff like that. And so kind of just slowly started working with him in Hawaii. And then, yeah, and then this year on the road. Do you think that your actual surfing changed after you started working with him or was it more a competitive approach and, and stuff like that? It was little things, you know, mm. and it was things that I saw in my own surfing that I was like, okay, I see, I see that I need to focus on this here, you know, like, and, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I had to work on was the in-between surfing. I spent my whole life taking off on a wave and going as fast as I could to get from point A to point B on the end, you know? <laughs> rather than figuring out what's in the middle there, I just would just pump and try to go do something big. Um, so we really worked a lot on the in-between surfing and finding boards that hold speed through that in-between surfing. And so, yeah. Hmm. When we were talking to, um, Trav Ferre a couple of weeks ago, I, I rewatched, um, uh, Dear Suburbia, and that kind of had a, a young John Florence in there, I think, before he, it must have been right around that time, 2010, 2011. Um, you know, in Japan, I think he went to the Caribbean with Chippa, it's kind of some of those movies you were talking about before. It was, uh, it's interesting to watch, like, kind of what you're saying, where you were focused on like big maneuvers and big sections, and a lot of the in between stuff wasn't really, wasn't shown, that's for sure, but I guess you don't really show it in surf movies that much, but. Yeah, it looked like you were you're definitely focused on hunting big sections. Yeah, and I think that just comes from that environment. You know, when you're in that environment, you're thinking of movie clips and you're like, well, I gotta do a big air, or it's gotta be a big turn or a big barrel or whatever it is and whatever waves you're getting. And so you're just thinking about the biggest maneuver you can do on that wave. And the whole rest of the wave just becomes set up for that maneuver. What are um when you're out there in West Oz, um, I know Main Breaks, one of the primary spots that we compete at is the box and North Point, but are there other spots out there that you like to focus on from a free surfing perspective? It just, I think it depends on the year. You know, some years we have a lot of off days and we get to kind of drive around and surf other little waves. But for the most part, when you're showing up at an event and the event's kind of running consistently, a lot of your focus goes into just getting your timing right out there. You haven't been there for a year. So you're dialing in your equipment, your fins, kind of everything. And just using your energy for those free surf sessions at those waves that you're going to be surfing. Yeah. Because it seems like a lot of guys too, <clears throat> they try to use that time to get photos or video clips and they'll go to, you know, cobbles or, or, you know, booted up or, or where like other spots around there that are maybe, as you said, they're easier to do kind of just one big maneuver and get the clip that they need or the photo or something like that. Yeah. And those waves, and I, I love those waves. They're so much fun. So good for airs, but it's like I said, it depends on the year. Some years we have a few lay days and you feel mm -hmm. like, okay, I've got all my stuff dialed. I kind of know what I want to do in the event. And so then you kind of have that freedom to go have that session where you're just pumping down the line and doing airs. Yeah. His brother again, good American boy, the facial hair and the white <laughs> wetsuit. <laughs> yeah, brother's been brother's ripping out, rips out uh, main break. He's such a good surfer out there. Yeah, and as you said, you, you and you've known him since you guys were little kids. Yeah, we've grown up together, and then it's been so much fun because the last couple of years we've been surfing together a lot on the tour, um, and you know we stay together in Brazil and it's just been fun because we both he's so fired up on competing and he's just he's just fired up and so it gets me super fired up too and it's great to have that energy and um around that's interesting you guys stay together in brazil but nowhere else uh yeah for brazil we just rent this big house together and it's pretty fun we have a surf out front and um and i think we were planning on france but the last two years i've only surfed 
half the year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're at the seven minute mark. You, I guess you have priority. Okay. Oh, I, I like this wave. This wave, when I was taking off, I was super excited. Like, forgot about my arm. I was like, oh my gosh, look at this wall. Oh, wow. What about that wave when you were taking off made you excited? There's just a certain uh, angle and wall to it that you see when you're taking off, and you're just the size of the wave, you just know you're going to be going really fast. Oh, Jack um, got a good one too. Oh, that was, yeah, that was cool. That was a good barrel. And when you have a board that you're that confident in, you can go that fast on, you're just like, oh my gosh, like I can't wait. Oh, that end section's so scary. <laughs> Jeez. But yeah, we have a wave here in Hawaii that's kind of similar to main break in a way on the right. And same thing that you take, that one comes and you take off on it and you're just like, you're going down and you're just looking at the wall like, oh, here we go. Like, and you just know that the angle and the steepness of it and like everything you want to do going into that. Well, I was going to ask you, I guess if, if you don't want to name it, you don't have to, but there is, there are obviously waves on the North shore that feel like they've prepped you for surfing these kind of conditions out of main break. Yes, for sure. Um, no, I don't want to name it, <laughs> but, uh, it, this, yeah, the way the, or there's been a couple of ways, you know, sunset, Holly, Eva, all these waves kind of have that similar big open face. Um, and you, where you're just going as fast as you can go and turning, essentially. <laughs> right. Oof. So compared to the other nine you got earlier, I mean, you had huge opening maneuvers on both waves. Which, which turn do you, from your perspective, do you think was better um, on that opening maneuver? Um, this one I really liked. For me, it was a lot of fun because I kind of, like right here, I follow through with it a little more mm. uh, rather where the other one was more of a layback kind of type thing. Right. Um, I don't know when you follow through like that, you just, you can feel it as that top corner of it feels really, really good. I don't know. It's hard to say the layback one felt really good too. <laughs> <laughs> they both looked really good. The, um, and when you come out of a turn like that and you're in a competitive situation, you're like, I need a score. Like, I mean, there probably have been years where that turn alone is like an eight. Like when you come out of that wave, are you just fired up to keep surfing the whole thing as much as you can? Or you're like, no, I'm a little bit spent. I'll just kick out and, and, or I'll just kind of tap it at the end. Cause you, you no, finish this wave really strong too. You're fired up. You're like, <laughs> you're going on all cylinders. Like, Oh my gosh. Like I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep surfing this way the best I can. They used to, um, they used to put the flags with the scoring. I always like that to see who was scoring who what, like, I think we'll try to bring that oh, back. Oh right? yeah. So, that was kind of sick. I yeah. like that. I think the judges were getting death threats. So we kind of just, <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. The, um, yeah, I always crack up when there's like, um, conspiracy theories about like, Oh, that guy got, he beat that guy by like a hundredth of a point. And you know, the judges just screwed him on purpose. I'm like, I really love the judges, but like, <laughs> those guys can't decide on where to go to dinner, let alone work out arithmetic like that in like 10 seconds. Yeah. So <laughs> they, yeah, it's, they just throw the score they know is right in their heart kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a hard thing judging surfing, you know, because everyone has such different styles. Everyone's riding completely different equipment. The waves are different. Every wave is completely different. So, um, I mean, they do a really good job for what they're dealt with, the job they're dealt with. <laughs> I think it's probably the most like passionately followed subjectively scored sport on the planet, like year in and year out. I know there's like Olympic sports and stuff, but there's just so many events and there's so many people that watch it. <laughs> this is a pretty hard, hard gig. It's a hard gig. <laughs> so, okay. So there's three, three minutes and change left. You've got a 19 to seven out of 20. What are you doing out there? Just chumming the water. He's just hanging out. Like, I mean, Jack's not getting two scores. Um, I think we're talking here. Maybe I don't know. I I don't know. When you have a heat like that, you're fired up. But at the same time, like when you're competing, you're competing from the beginning right. to the end. And I'm not going to leave any opportunity there for that. You know, like I'm yeah, still going to surf this heat to the end. And so, yeah. And, and yeah, based on based on the the just track of nines you put b 
before this heat, during this heat, and in the final. Where does this event kind of rate for you in terms of overall and performance? Was it your best event ever? Is it in the top five? Like, explain that one for us. It was definitely one of my best events ever because it's one of my best events ever because of the mindset I think I was in. And Mm -hmm. for me, that's so important. And like I was saying before, it's like, it's become my kind of like what I'm, it's become what I'm chasing in the competitive kind of platform is this mindset of it. And this event, I was really able to tune into that and be like, kind of have the competitive edge, but also let go and just surf the best I can surf. Um, if that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, I just, for sure. I think it's what we were talking about on. before too. Yeah. Where it's like, I, you know, you're looking to surf as best as you can in that, in those conditions, in that time frame, in the live arena with, with, you know, real stakes. Yeah. And so it's, it's really hard to, and that's really hard to do is to start to be able to let go and just be able to surf the way you want to surf the heat, the best you can surf it. Cause there's so many little things in your mind. Um, <laughs> You know, there's so much, so much going on. Like you don't want to lose. You, you only have five minutes left. Whatever you didn't get the first wave. I don't know. But when you can really tune into that, and you don't care about that, you're just like, okay, whatever wave comes to me, I'm just going to surf my absolute best on this wave. And so, yeah, trying to kind of always create that mindset for heats, and that's what's fun for competition for me. For sure. So, you know, at this point, you know, are you feeling more or less untouchable? You're, you got your title, you're (laughs) combined with the ability to kind of outperform the field by such a radical margin and equipment that even the world's best surfers are looking at and going like, that looks like the best board I've ever seen. Like, are you, is your, is this the most confident that you'd been up until this point in terms of being a professional surfer? For sure. Yeah, definitely. It was like. This year was, I felt so good through the year and I felt like that was, everything clicked in for me. Like the year before, I was just so focused on the process and it was like, felt more grindy in a sense. Where this Mm. year I just felt like I was able to really kind of just like take a deep breath, let go and just let myself compete kind of. Right. And in doing that, like I had some of the most fun heats of my life. This one looked like a fun one. Until right. Oh yeah, maybe not that part. <laughs> so you said you had to go get stitches in between this seat and the final. Yeah, I thought I broke my arm, but uh, it just was super bruised. It was so swollen for like a week until bells started. But yeah, it was it was sore, but I was. It was cool though because I was like. Um, you know, my arm hurt so bad, but I was just so fired up and just adrenaline's going. You're just like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for the next heat. <laughs> and that heat ended up being against brother as well. Yeah, we've had two finals out there together now, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's awesome for you. You beat him twice. <laughs> yeah, I'm stoked, but uh, I don't know. It's I just have had luck with waves, I guess. <laughs> Now you look pumped. Yeah, that was that was that was a fun heat. That was a fun event. That was one, of, one to remember for me for sure. It's one that I always go back to when I'm getting ready for the year. Of like, okay, what kind of mindset am I looking for? And it's like that's like my mindset. Replicate the conditions that you kind of went into that event psychologically, and say like, okay, if I can do this at every spot, even if the waves are different, the stakes are different, I, I can kind of come out on top. Yeah, and it's hard because everywhere is different. There's always different situations. So, but it's just that kind of overall like relax of the shoulders. Like, okay, I'm just gonna serve my best here, and that's all I have to worry about. I don't know. That that was just what was in my head that whole event. And um, you know, some of the best heats I've had since then is when I've been really able to click into to that kind of mode. Yeah, and at the start, you mentioned this earlier because you guys came on tour at the same time, but at the start of last year in 2019, when you were coming back before you got hurt again, we were kind of treated to this dynastic superpower battle between yourself and Gabriel, who were both starting 2019 with two world titles apiece. Um, you know, to this day, does someone like Gabriel occupy more space in your mind than other competitors? And if so, is it 
a talent thing or an achievements thing? Like, like does he, is he a little bit different to the rest of the field? Um, he's definitely a little bit different to the rest of the field. He's like I said before, he's a machine and he's such an incredible competitor. And, um, last year I really was having fun, you know, like kind of feeding into that battle almost of like, okay, like, uh, he's got two, I've got two, like, I want to get a third before he gets his third. And yeah, I mean, I mean, that was exciting for me and that was exciting. I like, that was kind of like a driving force for me in a way last year. It was just like, I just want to compete my best. Yeah. And I mean, you were so far ahead before you were, you were pulled out of the race for injury too. And now, you know, Italo Ferreira has this radical title win in the final heat of the season against Gabriel. Did you watch that heat go down? And if, if so, what were your thoughts watching it? Um, yeah, I watched that go down and it was, it's so gnarly that have a title come down to the final like that. That's, I think that's the coolest thing. And one of the coolest things that can happen in our sport is to come down to the very last heat of the year at pipe for the world title. And, um, it's amazing to watch, you know, you know, the pressure those guys are going through, especially in that situation. And so I just felt like. I was enjoying watching it, thinking, <laughs> thinking about the stress that those guys are under. Well, and I mean, kind of what you've talked about too, it, it seems like you're seeking out kind of unique experiences and conditions in terms of how is this going to change the way I surf? How is this going to sharpen the way I surf? And, you know, that, that experience of saying this is the final heat of the entire season and the world titles on the line is, is one that would be a new one, you know, for you. That would be awesome. Cause I mean, I feel like that's the extreme pressure situation that you can get to in in our in our sport and so to be able to get into that controlled mindset of not being stressed and just letting go and surfing your best um i don't know i feel like that would be the greatest achievement so moving ahead as we all kind of continue to navigate this extended hold where's your head at in terms of motivation in your surfing like competitive or otherwise like what's getting you through the day the week and and into this next space of of being able to compete again i guess um so i like went through this whole thing of training Uh, i spent the last six months training you know to get up in the pipe and getting ready for the tour that we thought was going to start and then um so this whole thing's been kind of on hold now and i'm feeling really good again surfing and so I'm kind of just taking this time to like, uh, I'm still focusing a little bit on the competitive side of it, but I'm d- it's kind of more of a, I've switched it now. I'm just focusing on having fun surfing with a little, little bit of the competitive side rather than mostly competitive, less having fun. <laughs> not <laughs> that it's not fun, but just less like free surfing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, focused. So now I've just been having a lot of sessions, which is, going out and trying airs and going out and trying big turns and just enjoying surfing because I haven't had that this time to do that. And so long it's been between injury, resting, getting ready for the next year. It's, it's always been such an ongoing thing. So I've just been kind of using this time to take a step back, let my knee, knee heal completely and just really enjoy having fun surfing. Well, rad. Well, I hope we all get through it and can't wait to see you back in there. Before we go, we've got two more segments. Um, the first is called the Pandemic Survival Kit. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I'll share some answers on my side too. We can uh, we can chit chat about it. But got it. what is uh, one food you found you were eating more than you imagined during the pandemic? Um, <clears throat> I have been eating a lot of tomatoes because we have a we have like a little piece of land with a bunch of stuff growing and our tomatoes are going off for the last month <laughs> that's good so we've been eating we, lots of tomatoes we had a gopher or we have a gopher and um one of the guys that i talked to said well you know they don't like tomatoes so you should plant tomatoes so we just planted some the other day we don't have anything nice yeah. <laughs> they're pretty fun when they start going off because they're just like there's so many on the little tomato bush and you can use them for everything just kind of have them yeah. snack them I've been eating lately uh, way more jelly beans than I thought I would. And I ate a lot before the pandemic, but between you know Easter and my I've been birthday, M&Ms. hammering. 
I have a nice, we have a nice jar of M&Ms in the closet and I kind of walk by and take a couple every time I, every time I walk by. <laughs> is, it, is it in the closet? Cause it's out of sight, out of mind, but then you're like, I'm still going to go in there and get some. Yeah. Like it's like in the pantry and I walk over there and I'm like, I'll take five, seven. <laughs> and then I like walk out and eat them real slowly. <laughs> yeah. The jelly bellies are in the dumb waiter, but it doesn't slow me down at all. <laughs> Okay, next question for the pandemic survival kit. Uh, feed your mind. What is one book recommendation that you uh, you would give to people? Sapiens is mm. a really good book. Um, kind of a cool book on human history, and you know, it gives an idea of where we've come from. I guess uh, I really liked reading that. And then the Dune series. Mm. I heard I heard that they're still caring because they're making they're remaking the movie for Dune. Yeah. And that they're not slowing down like the release date, like they're just forging ahead. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I, I can't um, wait for the movie. I hope it's really good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because the I books are reading, incredible. Yeah, it does look amazing. Um, Nick Carroll gave me this book like two years ago, and I've only just gotten around to it. It's The Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins by Hal Whitehead and Luke Rendell. It is rad. It's dense, but it is, um, man, oh, it that's is kind of cool. Yeah. It really breaks down like how special those creatures are in terms of creating their own kind of culture. I might, have to di- I might have to dive into that. There you go. Okay. Um, next question. Rest your mind. What is one TV show recommendation for the pandemic? Mm, one TV show. I like, I don't like serious TV shows, so <laughs> okay. I don't normally watch TV sh- serious ones, but I watch like the planet earth ones really good, but mm. there's a few different ones now. I don't know. There's a couple of different ones. Those are nice to go to sleep with and yeah. just really, really w- funny. Like just n- like, you don't even think you just watch the shows, you know, kind of mindlessly. <laughs> and I watch a lot of those. Those are always changing. That's, like I think that's good. That's good for the pandemic. I watched triple zero on Amazon and it was like an eight episode series about the drug trafficking between Italy, Mexico, and New Orleans. <laughs> oh, that man. was very serious. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was so good though. Like I kind of thought I heard someone say like, you shouldn't watch it. it. It might, that topics might stress you out even more right now. And I thought so too, but it wasn't that bad. It actually made me feel better. Okay. Yeah, last my mom and my brother's been watching like some pandemic videos. Oh no. And I'm like, yeah. stop watching those. <laughs> it's terrible. I saw that on like Netflix. They're like popular this week is contagion. I'm like, why would you want to? <laughs> yeah, contagion. That was the one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're living it. Settle down. Okay, last question for the pandemic um survival kit. Um, feed your heart. What is a movie that you'd recommend to people? A movie. Interstellar. Mm, sure a lot of okay. people have seen it but i do like that movie that one's kind of serious john that's not that's not a turn your brain off one i know but i feel like it's, it just has that exploration and that's like mm. i don't know i love that part of it that is cool i watched um thor ragnarok by taika watiti um the other day oh is that, that good that, it's so good it's so funny that is a good tv show vikings oh, okay that reminds me of vikings all right good but yeah Cool. All right. Well, so one more section, then we're going to let you go. Appreciate your time. Um, This one's the lightning round. You're not going to get my answers, but these are 10 questions. You should answer as fast as you can. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, what would you choose? Thruster. Coffee or tea? Oh, don't make me choose. I have coffee every morning and tea every night. <laughs> okay. Burrito or pizza? It's, uh, pizza. <laughs> uh, last book you read? Last book I read was one of the Dune books. Best surf film ever? In the summer, too. <laughs> Or North Shore. <laughs> All right. Um, do you know that Chandler is my next door neighbor? The guy who played him? Is he really? Yeah, Greg Harrison. That's amazing. He's, he's That's amazing. right through that window. Wow. He That's rules. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. 
Okay, I'm not done yet. One wave you never have to go back to. One wave I never have to go back to or that mm. I don't want to go back to? Either or. Uh, I, I can't even think of that. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> if you only got to surf one wave the rest of your life. I would, would there be no one out? Sure. It'd be pipe and backdoor. Okay. It has a lot of different sides to it. Best person to share a lineup with. Mm, I like sharing the lineup with my brothers. Worst person to share a lineup with. Um, Jamie O'Brien at pipe. <laughs> The last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. I will next achieve a state of happiness by eating a really good, healthy lunch. <laughs> Great. John Florence, thank you for joining us on the lineup at Low Tide. All right. Thanks, Dave. So that's it. That's the lineup at Low Tide's conversation with John John Florence. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. A huge thank you to John for his insight and candor. The lineup will return with these conversations every week. If you haven't already, please download, listen, rate, and subscribe to our podcast. We've gotten some really positive and kind reviews, and that helps the podcast spread and allows us to do more. So if you have time, open up your podcast app, give us five stars or whatever you feel is fair, and leave a review. It really helps us out a lot. A thank you to Ryan Fawcett, our producer and editor, and Cody Minling for the graphics and artwork. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of The Lineup at Low Tide. I hope you safely get some waves wherever you are, and we'll see you then. Do you like that? Well, if so, Subscribe over there and then watch more videos over there and then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.